a church where people desire the word, they want to hear the word, they want to take it in. An added blessing for me is to have so many people raised up to, to teach themselves and to lead and, and, and such a small fellowship. I don't know if you know how special it is what we have here, but to have so many uh, other teachers and, and leaders raised up is a, is a wondrous thing. But the, the beauty of this exercise, as, as Graham just said, is and these are the thoughts of the congregation writing this message. And if you don't think that warms this pastor's heart, you don't, you don't understand me at all. Um, that is just one of the coolest things ever. So uh, keep sending him stuff. That's, that's glorious. Uh, John chapter 20. I hope this book is blessing you the way that it is me. I, I, it seems like every book that I teach ends up being my favorite, at least for a time. Um, but I can't imagine this book never being my favorite again. This, it, it has just blown me away. The, and we've taken a long time to go through it. We're nearing the end now. We've taken such a long time to go through it. It's only 21 chapters, but it's just, I was talking to somebody the other day. It's just John just strips away all the fluff. There's, there's nothing that he says that isn't important, that doesn't have really deep, important meanings. Not just knowledge to take in, but applicable uh, wisdom uh, for how we could proceed for the rest of our life in deciding who we're going to be and how we're going to act and, and what we're going to do. And uh, uh, it's glorious. So praise God for that. Let's praise God for that. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, writing down and protecting these wonderful, valuable, uh, imperceivably important messages uh, for us thousands of years ago uh, that we could stand here and sit here today and read this word and still get all of the important meaning out of it that you intended so long ago. It's by the power of your spirit that it was written and I pray this by the power of your spirit that it is shared uh, again and received again today. May we look at it with new eyes today, wait, waiting to see what it is that you want to share with us that maybe we've missed before. Your word is so deep that, that sometimes we, we gloss over things that, that don't seem like that big a deal because you have us focused on something else. But, but may each time we go through, may we be looking for that thing that's important for us today. And I pray that you would reveal that to us by your power today. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. John chapter 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter. And came to the tomb first. Important little nugget you need to know. <laughs> so Mary sees that the rock has moved. In other, other accounts we see that the, the ladies are going to the tomb on Sunday morning to, to perform this valuable service. The, the burial was so rushed uh, on Friday because it had to be done before 6 o'clock. And, and they're worried that it wasn't completely done ceremonially correctly. And they want to finish the job. So they're going as soon as they can. On Sunday morning, it says it's still dark. This is probably before six in the morning. Um, and, and so they're on the way. And in the other accounts, we, we hear that they're worried all their way there about how they're going to get the rock moved. And now we see, uh, again, when, when they get there, we see this through Mary's eyes. Hey, the rock is gone already. And I just love that simple message. Sometimes we spend so much time worrying about things. And what are we going to do about this or that or the other? And it's things we're never going to actually encounter. Let's wait until we have a problem to start wondering how we're going to solve the problem. Amen? All right. So Mary sees that the rock has moved, and that's all she sees. She doesn't go closer. She doesn't investigate. She makes an assumption, perfectly logical, rational, reasonable uh, decision based solely on the simple fact that the stone has moved, and she reacts immediately. All she knows is that something big has happened, that she needs help of some sort, so she goes where I would go if I needed somebody to take action. She goes to Peter. Peter and John don't disappoint, right? They're running. A and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the, linens, the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. See, what if we change the, the um, 
uh, what's the word? What if we change the tone of voice for uh, verse 8? What if it's then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also? What if he's pointing out that though he outran Peter and got there first, Peter was the one that showed courage. Peter's the one who chased after the truth more vigorously than John did. That's what I see. Sure, John could run faster, and sure, he went a step further than Mary. He at least peeked around the corner to see what might be going on inside the tomb. See, at this point, uh, up until this point, nobody knows whether Jesus is there or not. They just know the rock has moved. But it's Peter. The same Peter who watched on at a distance before beginnings of testimony being given against Jesus. The same Peter who denied he even knew Jesus before. It's Peter who rushes into the tomb. Ready to know all that can be known. Ready to do whatever needs to be done. And it's John who points that out. By making sure we know that he then followed Peter in. I've never seen that before. Clearly, I think that's what it's saying. Here's the point, though. What did they see? Remember Joseph and Nicodemus wrapping Jesus kind of mummy style, right? That's how it was done with strips of linen, 100 pounds of spices uh, intended to control the smell and all that. And, then, and, and, and they place him in the tomb. Now, Jesus is gone and only the strips of linen remain. But it's not just that the body is gone and the linen remains. This is also very puzzling. The linen is lying there still in the spot where Jesus had been laying. Still in the shape of his figure. Just lying flat. That doesn't make any sense at all. This would have been a real reason for confusion when they first saw that. Remember their minds are swirling with questions at this point. There's no preconceived notion that Jesus' body shouldn't be there. They don't understand the resurrection yet. It's not on their mind. Nobody was there that morning expecting to see an empty tomb. And yet there's more when they get there. Wait a minute. What we do see doesn't make any sense. But why had someone wanting to steal the body of Jesus taken the time to unwrap it first? Why would somebody wanting to steal the body of Jesus, feeling they needed to unwrap it first, take it and lie it so carefully back in the exact same position where it looked like it had been there when he was wrapped in it? Why was the, the cloth that, that covered the, the, the face and the head wrapped neatly and, and laid where the, the head would have been? This doesn't make any sense. So many questions, and yet they're confronted with this other mystery. Peter is standing there wondering about that when, uh, in verse 8, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. Wait, wait, wait a minute, what just happened here? Believed, in, in the Greek, entrusted, had faith. It's that belief. Not just I think something happened, but wait a minute, I'm starting to get the picture here. What exactly is going on here? Well, again, here's where the English language is going to let us down. English does not have enough words to convey the meaning of Hebrew or Greek at all. We have three C's here. In verse 5, uh, he's stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Verse 6, uh, then Simon Peter came and he went into him and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And now in verse 8, then the other disciple went in also and he saw and believed. Same word in the English, three times. You know what? It's three different words. Three different words that don't mean the same thing at all. The first one, verse 5, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he didn't go in. That just means noticed. He took in the visual information. There is linen uh, cloth there. The next one, when we see Peter go rushing in and he sees it, that, that word saw means gazed. Not just saw, but like he's really looking at it. 
He's trying to figure out what's going on. And then the, the other word here in verse 8, he saw and believed, speaking of John, that one means understood. Like, oh, I see. And from the distance, you might, you might see something. You don't know what it is yet. You just see something. As you get closer and you're staring at it, oh, I see what that is. But as you really contemplate it and you start working out what it means in your mind, that thing that you saw and you see, now you're like, oh, I get it. That's what that is. It's not what I thought it was at first. That's the transformation that has gone on through these three verses with that same English word. See, English just doesn't measure up. Noticed, gazed, pondered, really looked at, understood. Uh, took in the overall picture, looked hard at it, trying to understand, came to the realization of the truth. The body of Jesus is gone, and the linen wrapping remains. But the linen wrappings remain seemingly unbothered, seemingly untouched, still in their proper place as if the body of Jesus evaporated up through them. Oh. It did exactly that. See, saw, see. There's still plenty of confusion, okay? But they've taken a giant leap here in logic, in evidence. Still plenty of confusion, verse 9. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They still didn't know why Jesus has risen, but the physical evidence has proven to them that he has risen. It's the only thing that makes any sense. If somebody had unwrapped that body for some reason, after they stole it for some reason, and again, who would steal the body of Jesus? The only logical ones to steal the body of Jesus, if this was all a lie, would have been the disciples, and they didn't get it. So they weren't expecting it to be empty, so they weren't going to steal it. Wouldn't have made any sense for the Jews to steal it. It would have backed up the claims of Jesus. And it wouldn't have made any sense for the Romans to steal it. They didn't care one way or the other. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about the Jews or the Gentiles. So if somebody stole the body, which doesn't make any sense in the first place, why would they have unwrapped it, which wouldn't have made any sense in the second place? And third, if they had taken the time to unwrap it, why would they have placed it back in the same exact place that it was as though Jesus evaporated up through it? See, the physical evidence is strong from this eyewitness testimony. Strong enough to, to give them an understanding that resurrection has happened. Not enough to understand why resurrection happened, what its purpose is. They still don't know why. And I picture them walking away slowly, like just dazed and confused. Because it's odd. I mean, that's the next thing. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. What? Hey, I think Jesus was resurrected. Lunch? <laughs> uh, what? This is weird, right? I just, I just picture them walking away like muttering to themselves, just incoherently, you know, dazed and confused, like somebody whose brain is just locked up. <laughs> they wander away, and they forget about poor Mary. She's still there. The one who came and got them saying, I need help. They go rushing in. Dun, da, da, da. And then they just go home. And she's still there. But take heart. Mary has not been left, nor has she been left forsaken. Though the one she went to for help had none for, she's still seeking truth. And she's still seeking understanding. And though she has been left there by herself, she isn't alone. Right? Verse 11. I'm going to read this whole little passage here. Place yourself in Mary's shoes. Think about her mourning before I read this. 
She gets up way early. She probably hasn't slept all night. Still dark outside. On the way to the tomb. Reliving the events of Friday. Of this Jesus whom she loves so dearly. Of watching him die on that cross. Of watching them take him down and haul him away. And she knows that then they wrapped him up. But they couldn't have done it properly. And that doesn't show him the proper honor. And they had to hurry up and get him in that tomb before 6 o'clock. And it got sealed. And he's been laying in there all weekend. And I have got to get there as soon as I physically and legally can and finish that job because I have to honor him. He is my Lord. That's how her morning starts. She's on the way to the tomb. They're worried about how to get the rock moved. When they get there, the rock has moved. And she's like, what in the world? Somebody has taken the body of Jesus. She runs all the way to Peter and John, wherever that was. And then she runs all the way back. And then they go in. And something happens in there. She doesn't know. She still hasn't looked in. They go running in, charging in like the cavalry, and they come walking out like morons. <laughs> and just walk away. And that leads her to this point, verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, just to say, teacher. This is a glorious passage of scripture. So full of love and the grace of God. Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will fine Mary hadn't actually looked into the tomb until now all she knows is that Peter and John went in there they experienced something powerful so she takes a peek and through her tears of grief in the midst of her deepest mourning she sees something much different than what Peter and John saw she sees two angels now what do we see happening time and time again in scripture when humans encounter angels they try to worship them Right. They they crouch in, in fear. Right. Sometimes they pass out. Just at the sight of angels, they're such glorious creations of God, not Mary. She's so distraught about the fact that the body of her Lord is missing. She can't see them as anything more than potential help for her cause. I don't even know if she registers that they're angels. She doesn't register it as odd that two guys dressed in white are sitting in the empty tomb. Jesus, I think, emotionally touched by her inability to think of anything else, appears next to her and speaks. How wondrous. How great is that? She can't even break out of her grief to recognize him. Still, she's pleading for help. Do you know what is going on? Will you help me? If not, just tell me where he is and I'll go get him. This little girl says, tell me where the body of Jesus is. I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to get it. Nobody will help me find. I am going to get his body. I'm going to bury him properly. And nobody's going to stop me. Poor Mary. Now, parents of little kids, you like to scare your kids? <laughs> ever put on a mask as a joke and accidentally scare one of your kids to the point of terror like you really weren't expecting that right feels awful right <laughs> right <laughs> feels uncomfortable and you just want to fix it as quickly as possible don't you <laughs> before mom knows at least yeah here's the thing how fast do you rip that mask off make sure they knew it was you all along? 
that they had nothing to fear, that everything was okay. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. He spoke to her. And she's so out of her mind with grief, she can't recognize him. Jesus said, my, my sheep know my voice. There's nothing here that says that he clouded her mind that she wouldn't understand. There are other places where that does happen. It doesn't say that here. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? I just want somebody to help me find my Jesus. Mary. It's like, hey, open your eyes, open your ears. Look, I am right here. How precious is the entire part of this section of the story. I love it. No one was at the tomb expecting to see him alive that morning. And here's the cool thing. He gave them all the breadcrumbs they needed to come to the realization of the truth. For Peter and John, he knew they needed to see the burial linen. And they needed to begin to work it out logically before he revealed himself. To them he wanted them to ponder that and find him that way for mary he knew that she was so emotionally distraught that she was only going to be consoled by seeing him so he lets peter and john just go home he watches them walk away and he looks back to mary and he reveals himself to her why? Because that's what she needed. His little girl was hurting. And he did what he had to do to make sure that hurting stopped. <laughs> she was looking for Jesus. Peter and John were looking for clues. They saw a great mystery. They're trying to figure out the mystery what does Mary keep saying? Somebody tell me where Jesus is. She was looking for Jesus, and she found him. They were looking for clues. They found him. John saw and understood. Believed. She's looking for Jesus. Guess what? She found him. Nobody understands the significance of the resurrection at this point, but Jesus is leading them all toward it in the way they need, at the pace they can travel so they will understand that's my jesus and he will meet you where you are and lead you to where you are trying to get to where he's trying to get you to but wait there's more 17 jesus said to her do not cling to me for i have not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say to them i am ascending to my father and your father and to my god and your god Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Do you see it? There's a word here that should astound you. Anybody? Brethren. Jesus, speaking of the other disciples, says, go and tell my brethren what you have seen. What does that word mean? Well, you go look it up, and there are actually two words in the Greek translated as that one word brethren there. So you've got a noun and kind of a modifier of that noun to get to the meaning of this word. The first one means literally brother in the familial sense, relation. The other, the, the modifier means companion, so someone who experiences a shared circumstance, a shared reality. So again, 
Jesus is revealing another layer to this complex relationship that he's designed for us to have with him. And if we're not careful, we can miss it. We can just read right over it. Because we've heard it so many times. And we say that word, brethren, brother, is what we would say. We say it all the time. We call one another that, brother, sister. We don't think much about it. But for Jesus to say that word concerning us is a big deal. Such a complex relationship with him. So hard to understand, but trust me, it is worth the time to dig into and try to get it because you don't want to leave any of the blessing behind because with every level of complexity, every, uh, every layer of the onion that gets peeled off that is the, our relationship with Jesus, there's just another blessing on top of another blessing on top of another blessing. Different blessings, same relationship. Things that seem inextricably opposed to one another. All working together to define this relationship that he has designed for us. This has nothing to do with what we want, what we desire, uh, and nothing that we can create or manifest. This is the system he has set up to relate to us. First and foremost, he is Lord, God, creator, savior, redeemer. The proper respect for the authority and the majesty of him in this context, face down in humility, arms raised in submission. It's the only thing that makes any sense. But just a few chapters ago, in this book of John, he threw out another term to represent our tie to him. Remember what it was? Friend. What? The king doesn't call his subjects friend. That's not how it works. It's how it works for God, apparently. The proper demeanor towards him in this context? Ease. Peace. Being comfortable just talking to him casually. At ease, fellowshipping with him in a, in a less formal sense. Now, though he alludes to a new level of connection with a, a new level of complexity and commitment attached to it, brother, Literally, family. Not just a band of brothers, we have gone through something. That's the companionship thing that ties people together in war or serious trial or, or serious grief that they go through together. You, you call somebody a brother or sister who has been, had that kind of same experience that you have and that has knit you together, some drastic thing. Not just that, this word means literally family. Brother, sister, father, son. It's not just a circumstantial similarity to what a family is. No, he is literally saying, brother, Family, co-heir, having the same father. It's the definition of the radical change in our lives from one moment to the next when we die and are reborn. Adopted into the family of God through his grace. The proper application in our lives when this context is added, that's a really long answer. We'll glance at it for a minute, okay? Let's look at, at all three. A Lord and Master rightfully expects his loyal subjects to react positively to his every command, to do what he says to do. We should be meditating on the Scriptures day and night, as David said, seeking ways we can honor our God by treating him as though he is our God. This is in no way meant to be a means of earning his favor or earning our salvation or trying to impress him or prove anything to anyone. It's simply professing by our actions, not our words, by our actions that we believe him to be the supreme authority of the universe and therefore the supreme authority of our lives. 
Paul exhorts us to proactively make this a priority in our lives. In Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the only thing that makes any sense. If you actually think that God is God, that Jesus is God, that the Holy Spirit God is living inside of you, your life should reflect that in that it is given to him. You have given him charge in first corinthians uh, paul says or do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and you are not your own for you were bought at a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are god's that's the first way we relate to him but jesus says he also chooses to call us friends what is a friend that's somebody whose company you enjoy Somebody whose thoughts you desire to know. Whose conversations you seek out because it blesses you. It's somebody you just want to hang out with. By choice. That's pretty cool. Amazingly, Jesus seems to desire such a relationship with us. Not instead of, but in addition to master, slave. It was a mic drop moment. <laughs> but Jesus now adds to all of this an even deeper level of connection, a familial bond that goes beyond the chosen fellowship of friendship. You can't choose your family, right? Jesus says that his sheep, his subjects, his friends are also his brethren. What does this add to our already complex relationship. Well, uh, emotionally, in a deeply meaningful way, it's, it's this protective support and commitment to the well-being of the other person as an individual and the entire family as an entity. See, a family, being part of a family, that has some responsibility with it. Your friends come and go. Sometimes family comes and goes in our, in our lives in, in aspect to who's close to us and who's not. They're still literally family. I have family members I haven't spoken to in years. But all they would have to do is call on me. I'm there. If I saw them in trouble, I would be right there. I had a commitment to them. Because we have a bond that, that we didn't ask for. That it, was, it was foisted on us, given to us, I would rather say. And it's deeper than friendship. You might have a lot of the same emotionals. You might, you might have a lot of the same uh, concepts of how you react to somebody who is a close, close friend. But it is, it is literally different. So there's a commitment there. And there's also the expectation that whatever affects any of the other members of the family will affect you. As somebody in a household who has gone through something difficult this last year. How you doing? It's been a tough year for our family. We have had a hard time. Or we have had a great time. There's a, a thing there where the, 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 what's the word? I've used connection too many times. I'm going to use connection. The, the way people are linked together. In this case, uh, in, in our case, by DNA, and maybe spiritual DNA would be the way to look at it uh, here as we are a new creation. There, there, there's something about that uh, tie that means that if you poke this part with a stick, this part hurts. If something great happens to this person, we, we say, oh, our family is doing great. Our family had a great day. Jesus is drawing us into that kind of connection with him. This is why we pray for, uh, and we use the term, and I totally get it. I'm, a, I'm not even going to look at Hector. I'm going to use the term, the persecuted church. And I get why he doesn't like that term. Be, because even though we gather to pray for them, if we call them the persecuted church, it's almost like that's that church and this is our church. When there's only one church, there's only one family. So we gather together to pray for in support of and, and hopefully in protection of family members. 
who are in a place where they're being persecuted. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Go and tell my brethren what you've seen. Go and tell those who are connected to me in a, in a familial bond now, whereby what happens to me happens to them, what happens to them happens to me. Go tell them what you have seen. This is special. This is not something that any other religion offers, even attempts to offer. It's a blessing beyond what we usually think of, honestly. It's the shared level of experience because of your undeniable association with all the others you are now joined to. This is the fullness of the new reality of the new creations that, that we who have received the grace of the new covenant now are. We have in Jesus not only a Savior, but a Lord. Not only a Lord, but a friend. Not only a friend, but a brother. It doesn't take away any of the others. That's the complex part. He's still Lord. And your buddy. That's your brother. This is a big deal. May we always seek to experience what each of these aspects of our relationship with Jesus offers. We need to go after this. Why did Mary see and hear from Jesus that morning? Why is she the first one to speak to the resurrected Lord? She was seeking him. She was looking for him. She wanted to minister to him. And so what happened? As she's looking for him, he found her. How glorious is that? May we always be looking for all of the blessings that are open. Why not? Why not? Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful message. Thank you, Jesus for your death, your burial, and resurrection, which gives us hope for the future you have promised to us. Thank you that you have conquered sin in the grave. Thank you for the delicate way we see you handling your disciples. Thank you for the delicate way, the gracious way, the loving way we see you uh, handling those who love you. And thank you for adopting us into the family of God. Thank you for choosing us. See, that's the beauty of adoption. That's a kid who got chosen. Asked to come in. Brought in. Made part of the family. And that's what you have done for us, Jesus, and we praise you for it. Thank you. In the season where we're celebrating your birth, let us remember all the blessing that came from your death and your resurrection, which gives us the chance for rebirth. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. Thank you for this wonderful day we've had. May it continue. And may we be like Mary, seeking you. Hopefully not in grief, because we haven't seen you in a while. We don't know where you are. But seeking you nonetheless. Because I believe you find those who are seeking you. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you are. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, love y'all.